Is that a dress you're wearing? No, it's a shirt. Okay. A, or a blouse. It's a blouse. A blouse. <laughs> <laughs> I love how we just both just filmed it up. <laughs> Not that it was the only time, but like the very, my very first relationship. It had all sorts of elements of abuse in it. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. I had some sort of awareness that what was happening was just really fucked up. Yeah. And I knew that, but I was really like, I let that thing go on for like a year. I would even, I wouldn't tell my girlfriend at the time this. I would be like, we've been through so much together that I feel like nothing can ever yes you know make us and i really felt that i felt yeah. that i was like i had just bonded with her because i'd been through so much out of that just was traumatic and awful yeah. with her that i feel i felt like nobody else could ever be that close to me like thinking that you know what yes she has all these issues and i knew some of her backstory i knew she herself had suffered a lot mm -hmm. and you know i would just use all of that to really justify what was happening to me i really believe that if i were just like a more supportive partner and a more loving partner that slowly she'll come around and of course like this shit never stopped right it, it only got worse looking back at it i'm like i can't believe what it took for me to finally step out and how long I just let it go and justify it and rationalize it in all sorts of ways. I hear language a lot of the times like, you know, we went through so much and that it's, it's almost like there's a reason why we went through that. So you just can't leave all of that behind. And this, this, this connection that you form from that, that chaos, you just got to make it right. You just, you, you're going to stick it, you're going to stick in there to make it right. You got to make it right. You got to make it right. And it's like you're, you're putting the weight of this stuff on to you, us. We put it on to us so that we can try to make this thing better. And it doesn't work that way. It's like that notion that I wanted to believe that I had some control over the situation. By, by, by thinking that there was, there was just, there must be something I could do to make her mm -hmm. stop abusing me. There must be, because right. to believe that there is nothing I can do, it was, it's, a th it's a terrifying thought. No, I just need to fucking leave. <laughs> like, right. you know? Yeah, yeah. Other people see the, the chaos and the, the turmoil, right? And so you make excuses for it constantly, yeah. right? It's like, oh, this is happening because, oh, but they didn't mean that because of this. You smooth it over around with everyone, mm -hmm. whether it's the kids or the friends or the coworkers or anything mm -hmm. like that. And looking back, I can see the pattern that I engaged in. And again, and this is not to say that like I was to be blamed for what happened to me, not at all. Mm -hmm. But it's like if you are chronically finding yourself in relationships with you know people who are toxic, maybe there is something happening here. And that was when I actually like really looked deep into my childhood stuff. I was really reenacting so much of my childhood through adult relationships mm -hmm. because then again, it's about the control thing. It's like the shit that happened to me as a child, I had no control. I, was, I felt so helpless. Of course, yeah. I didn't know that at the time, but like I was so, I was a child. And in my adult relationships, I've just found people or attracted people who I can somehow reenact those traumas with and then try to maybe do better this time. I've been seeing things along the way, but I think I've unearthed a really huge pattern and it's that, it's a reenactment um, that I truly uncovered. And it's like, I have been doing it throughout all of my relationship and this includes my friendship. I continue to surround myself or find people that are unavailable mm -hmm. uh, to me the way I need them to be available in terms of uh, communication mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. that's the thing that lacks and lacked heavily in my family um, this just total need and desire for open honest transparent communication and I continue to find myself in situations where I cannot have that 
I continue to ask of people that are not where I'm at. And the reason I continue to ask of people is my own fear around safety. Uh, the people that I choose um, are people that I feel safer with. And these are not the people that I am compatible with. So mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm the common denominator in the thing, right? Because right. you keep getting the same people. It's like, okay, what's the pattern? Why am I doing right. this? What am I trying to change? I, I really believe that this, this, these patterns really form in your childhood. And this is just mm. what your brain can identify as good, normal, uh, you know, what makes sense. Right. So trying to undo that, trying to get used to different patterns. Because enabling behavior is also like on a level is about the whole like, oh my gosh, I can fix this person. I can save this person. I very much was holding on to the role of providing emotional caretaking for my family right. members. And a role that a child should not be ha having. Where my comfort zone fell was with people who were extremely emotionally needy uh, and needed a lot of emotional care all the time. And of course, abusers who see that quality in someone like me and are happy to exploit it. So it's like, it's, a, it's like a perfect Lego pieces fit together and I'm getting something out of it too. Like I'm, I'm fulfilling right. that part of me and I'm of course enabling the abusive behavior, but right it becomes this like cycle where I just can't get myself out of it. Of course, like I can identify mm. it super well for other people. If like a friend of mine of came course. to me and said, <laughs> ah, this is, this is like what, this is the dynamic I'm having with someone. I'm like, honey, like you need to figure some things out here. <laughs> but when I'm in it, when I'm right. in it and, and, and it's just like, oh, this is so good. And, and I say this, it's like almost like an addict who's just got a fix. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, this up and down, the roller coaster. Mm, that's yeah. the good stuff. <laughs> yep, yep. And isn't it just like, you know, like you are saying, I can fix you. But it's like, it's, it's projection too, right? Because we are so, we are so like fucked up with our own shit. But we are like, let me project this stuff and let me go fix somebody else. Right? Yes. It's like, let me uh, help you. Because mm -hmm. if I'm helping you, I don't got to deal with my stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But at time, at, when I was doing that, I wasn't even thinking about that because I thought I was a okay at yeah. that time, at that time, yeah. when, especially when I was doing it in my twenties, I thought it was fine. And I was helping these just poor, unfortunate souls, you know, like they were just coming to me and I was like, wow, these people are really suffering. I'm just like really helping them. I just, my, I just have like a sign on my forehead that says, if you need help, just come to me. I'll, you know, date me and I'll help you. <laughs> And I, was like, I was like, no, bitch, you are fucked up. <laughs> you are just projecting and, you know, <laughs> and you are, you know, enabling people. And I was in really bad relationships in my, you know, my 20s. No, no good. No good. I think of these two, three really significant relationships I've had where I stayed way too long. You know, the, the way that it tends to work for me is that the, in the initial phase, it's like I put out basically the initial challenge, which is that even though I look so tough, I'm a total crybaby. And one of my partners in a really early date said, you know, you're a crybaby. Before I ever said anything, you know, you're gonna be my crybaby. And I was just like, ride or die, right? This person sees me, this person sees my trauma. He's gonna take care of mine and I'm gonna take care of his. And he totally opened himself up in ways I know he had never done. I've seen his, he's seen mine. The sex is unbelievable, right? There's this transformative stretch. And we had a transformative stretch that lasted a couple of years. I thought, my God, this is just never going to end. There's something so euphoric and energizing about seeing each other in these spaces. And it felt so transformative. All three of these people I'm thinking about, what eventually starts to happen is that they just start to be kind of casually cruel to me first it's just like a little word or a little way in a supermarket or whatever and it's just like completely shocking i'm the only constant in these three situations right these people are all very different and have very different life experiences so i am somehow contributing to this dynamic i just want to say as myself you know as my wherever i'm at in my own healing and generally then it escalates right that the disrespect and the cruelty just gets worse and worse uh, and, and a lot of times I'll try to use sex to have it come back together. I want to get back to that transformative space. That just makes it worse. 
and it makes me feel really degraded and ashamed and it makes I think the other person feel degraded and ashamed like objectified I think what happens for me in that bonding thing is that like once you show me it's like I'm ride or die for you I can see that humanity I can see that pain and it's like I don't care how bad it gets I know you're in there and I am going to stay with you and show you my love and um ugh, you know especially because so many of our people you know have just had so much fucking structural violence you know a one irish lover i had i had so much connection around our irishness and i mean there was just so much intergenerational trauma there around it right i was just fucking like i am not leaving um and you know you gotta go nobody starts off dating whether you're you know enabling or anything doing it perfectly like the, right. the point of it is you do it you learn from it you see your patterns you grow from it and you keep moving right but but here's the thing going back to that bonding thing something mm -hmm. that happens unfortunately in those that's why i really like the analogy of addiction with it because mm -hmm. it is in the term trauma bonding is used a lot for oh, yeah. when you are in the in this relationship with your abuser like emotionally it's just been so you know the peaks and the valleys are just so right. deep and uh tall and just like it's it's really hard to get out of that because mm -hmm. in a sense you feel like nobody else would understand me right like it changes you so much that then you recognize almost subconsciously you know the new person you've become why would you leave the one person who's for whatever reason is sticking around even if that reason is abusing you or exploiting you mm. that's the only person who's been a witness it's such a difficult thing to step yeah. out of the trauma yeah. bonding like it's been compared with the stockholm syndrome mm, yeah. i don't, I don't mm. know how much that holds mm. but um that's i why thought about that when you yeah. said that I, it popped in my mind when you said when you're talking about that yeah the person uh, identifies with their um, um, mm -hmm. abuser, assaulter, or the person who kidnapped them or anything like that. Which is so human. Like, honestly, mm. I, don't, I can't think of a single person who has done harm who doesn't have some humanity I can identify with. That's I'm sure many part, people right? would argue with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm an empath. In my defense, I'm an empath. I... <laughs> You know, I ha and that's that's another reason why. Yeah, yeah, I can I see the humanity too much. You know, mm. the compassion is like, oh, you poor thing. Yeah, I see why you got so fucked up. But you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> the breaking point was for me was here, and this is I'm, this is a confession moment. Like for a long time, like you know, I would be. I was like, gosh, I really just want to like date um, other people, like queer, trans, people of color, right. uh, disabled folks, like people who've just like had some experiences, gone through some should understand like what it's like to, to right. suffer, you know, immigrants, like all of that. Uh, because that's like my experience. Like so much of my life has been shaped by right. <laughs> just having gone through shit. And of course, sadly, it's like you go through trauma. Not everybody who goes through through trauma responds this way, but a lot of people who do, they end on the other side as someone who's a harm doer, who's uh, hurtful, who's mm -hmm. abusive. Some people respond to trauma that way. Right. Um, but because they will hold identities that I could identify with so much, right. they, had, they had stories that I could see myself in so much, I would let that go so much. Whereas I would, I, I would have my boundaries in place so much better with like a straight white cis dude. I'd be like, no, you don't get to treat me like that. What am I doing here? And, and the breaking point was that like, you know what? I've had a lot of shit happen to me in my life. And if I can manage to not be abusive, harmful, and toxic, right. I think I could set that standards for others. Mm. Regardless of what identities they hold, how much trauma they've experienced, what privileges they lacked in their life. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The big piece of this uh, for me is like the blame piece, the other mm -hmm. side of it, the blame piece, right? Because, of course, people do the blaming, the why 
why are you there? What, you know, why do you stay? What is going on? It's the, the, the not understanding. And of course, we're doing all the talking here, talking about how difficult and why it's, why the reason is, right? <laughs> why the reason is, but it always goes to the blame because it's yeah. so easy to blame. It's just so easy to just write it off. That person deserves to get what they want because they're there. That person should have left that person, whatever, you know, because it is um, much more, I guess, difficult or uh, it hurts too much or what you got to do something. Your consciousness is shifted. Once you really got to think about how complicated it is, how layered it is that, um, <clears throat> that someone could be an enabler for many, many reasons and that somebody stays with an abuser for many, many reasons. Um, there could be very valid reasons why that is, you know, um, and why trauma bonding um, occurs. But there's always blame for, for everything. Blame, when we, when we talk about CSA, when we talk about rape, when we talk about everything, the blame is always there. The, the, the undercurrent of it is blame no matter what, no matter what. And it's funny because it's not even, it's not only the external blame, which is so powerful and strong. Mm -hmm. It's also the internal blame. Yes, yes. Right? Even when you know you have your reasons for why you're not leaving, there is the blame. There mm -hmm. is the, you know, that's probably been the hardest thing for me to overcome. I look at, I look at myself and I'm like, I stayed. Like, I understand the reasons why I stayed. But then I'm like, but I stayed. I'm the kind of person who stays. What does it say about me? And it's, I yeah. hate that. I hate that I, I hate that me staying robbed me of a trust in myself. I've, I've stayed as well. You know, I've stayed, you know, a year past the time I should have, two years past the time I should have when things were bad. And why did I stay? You know, at same reason, you know, if I do this, it'll be different. Or, you know, maybe if we try this, then mm -hmm. maybe if we do this, then um, just thinking that I could make, I could shift something and make it all better because I didn't want to quit. And I really have to say that that a huge piece of that, a really huge piece of that is very much connected to my mom and connected to the things that she instilled in me about like, you know, sticking in with, you know, uh, relationships and marriage. Like one of the things that my mom was so proud of, so proud of was that she was the only one who got married mm. and stayed married. She, my father was the only man she was ever with. I know a lot of people have that, this idea of you can't break up. So you mm -hmm. do everything in your power, no matter what you don't. And I, you hear that constantly. I didn't want to break up the family. Uh, we, we put five years in, you know, I, I figured we could do that. And, and it's like, not at your expense, not at right. your health, not at your life, you know, the expense of your life, not at that. Um, but that idea of this, you know, this perfect family, this perfect relationship, this, this ideal. And sometimes people die for that shit. As a survivor, there have been times where I stayed. One of the times I stayed because I um, was not financially stable to be able to escape. At the time, I didn't realize it. But later when he tried to kill me, it became clear that he purposely had me in financial kidnapping so that I couldn't leave when I did wake up to see this person doesn't love me and he thinks that I'm just his sexual play toy and that he can beat on me and yell at me and verbally abuse me and emotionally abuse me. It took a lot to like, call other people and say, hey, I'm going to be homeless, but I'm leaving. Can you help? But it was like um, exhilaratingly empowering to choose to be homeless and live in my car than to stay a hostage um, victim. It took me 10 years to get out of debt, which 
just happened like two months ago and I'm so happy. It's hard work, but it's better than having stayed with him for 10 years and or not not be alive because he literally tried to kill me. So why do survivors stay? I, in my, in, in my personal experience, like I had no choice. Throughout my life, I have been a victim of uh, multiple sexual assault experiences. But at the beginning, right, I was a child. And so I couldn't go nowhere. The only place where I could go to was the streets and refuge myself into drugs. And I started using drugs when I was about eight years old. It's not that I wanted to stay. I, I, I feel like I had to stay. Um, and um, uh, um, and I also have to admit, right, like I think after a certain time, it sort of like became normal to me, right? Um, because I didn't have the love and the support that I needed. And that's how in some ways I was getting it. So I think over time, I also learned to enjoy it in some ways look for it, you know? Um, and even though I, I was still a child, right? Um, I was trying to get that love and support um, from, um, from the person that um, was the abuser. The model for healthy relationships we are given is that the way you measure the success of a relationship is how long they lasted together. Mm. Just how long mm. they were physically together. Right. Like that's yeah. really the, oh, that's like the top of the list for most people, even poly folks, even people who like really reject all sorts of things about relationships. There is still like so ingrained that piece of it that I've been with that person for that long. Mm. And it's like, how was it when you were with right. that person? Like right. Right. That, that's super secondary to how long you were with that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and really people do take a lot of pride in how long they could stick it out, how long they right. could just like tolerate it. It's like a, almost a weakness if you gave up. Right. Right. <laughs> right. You, have you heard of the called sunk cost fa fallacy? Mm -mm. So it's like when you basically send good money after bad. So like mm -hmm. it's often the example is given like you have a shitty car and you keep spending money on it. And the more money you keep spending on it, the more emotionally attached to it you get. And even though you're really losing money on the whole situation, you just right. keep investing in fixing this shitty oh, car right. that will never yes. be good enough. Yes, because <laughs> you've already put so much money into it, you're not going to stop. It's just, it's just, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, at, at that point, this is not a financial decision. This is a purely emotional decision, right? Right, yes, and yes. And that's, that's the thing that I feel like combined with this focus on how we've been together for so long. And I, I say this myself, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, we've been together, but for like five years, six years, seven years, like I've put so much work into this relationship. What if I break up and then my partner becomes finally the the you know the ideal yeah. partner I've been looking for <laughs> and, and again these are all emo like so subconscious and emotional and deep seated like the fears one of my fears was that I don't want to mm -hmm. start over going through so much with them again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like that starting over thing. But the but the flip side of that, which I think is hilarious, the flip side of that is once people do break up, I you know the the stuff that I hear is. I wasted five years of my life. I wasted 10 years of my life. And I'm like, wow. So the thing that you were fighting for for so long, the thing that you stayed in, unless it was horrible from beginning to end, then I could understand the waste. But God, yeah. I think that, again, we, we live in a culture. It's like this throwaway thing. It's like it's all yeah. or nothing. It got to work yeah. or it's, you throw it away take the good and the bad you know leave it behind and grow from the things that you love take that and the stuff that was not good learn from it and the next relationship do it try to do it better and better and better but people yeah. see it as such a failure such a failure yeah. and to me it's such a growth i'm learning myself a little better now but I digressed. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and actually that makes, uh, that's a really good point because it is, it is it's the truth. It's a truth mm. that even my abuser, the person who I stayed with for a year and 
she pretty much did everything. There's mm-hmm. a lot I am still grateful for. Now it's taken me over a decade to get to this place because honestly, there's been so much anger and right. sadness and so much, so many nightmares. Mm. So there's been just so much that I've struggled to at any point associate anything positive with that experience. But then the truth is, like, even someone like that, that I hold in a very dark place in my life, if it wasn't for my, that experience, like, I, my, the trajectory of my life would have been really different, right? Mm. Yes, yes. So I think really holding, holding all of that, if possible, I, I totally get it. I, the, the anger is a lot. The anger of, like, fuck, I just wasted so much. Yeah. Yeah, that that's true. Uh, it has its own space, but but yeah, there is also that reality. That's true. I mean, the feelings. I mean, the feelings are absolutely valid. Do not get me wrong, because people will be like, "Fuck that motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> I hate that." Of course, feel the feelings. Feel the feelings. <laughs> um, and when the feelings are felt, and you punch the pillow and all that stuff, like you know, you can grow from those things. I mean, it's really a, a really beautiful lesson if we really look at it. If we really look yeah. at it. Um, for me, for a while, healthy relationships or healthy, like, you know, non-toxic people, or at least people who wouldn't match with me in a toxic way, <laughs> right, they, right. They, would, they would show up in my life and I'd be like, oh, I roll, so boring, like, <laughs> no drama. And it's funny because for a while I used to say, gosh, I don't know why I have so much drama in my life. I'm not a dramatic person. And it's true, like, I'm not a dramatic person, but I'm like, why do all these dramatic people find me? And, you know, again, common denominator here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the truth of it is I would turn my head to people who wouldn't bring drama into my life because I thought they had nothing to spice up my life. With. Right, right. Yeah, there's something about those edges, you know, and so those edges are really pretty sometimes and they're not good for us <laughs> so we always have to be talking about that stuff yeah because it, it seems really familiar over there oh that chaotic stuff looks really familiar i know that i know yes. how to i know how to do that over there you and know. you know what's scary that familiarity we label it as chemistry oh yeah oh yeah Oh, absolutely. That's what, that's what that shit is. It's not fucking chemistry. It's you reenacting your trauma. Oh, yeah. It's like, that's it, hot. That's so hot. Yeah. It's in like deep layers in there. Mm-hmm. And like I was telling you, what scares me, even now, even with everything I know, what scares me is like, can I tolerate being in a relationship with a healthy person? someone who has done their work around their own trauma and their own boundaries and their mm-hmm. own communication, like stuff that we all need to do as adults. And nobody taught us, most of us, nobody taught us as children. And it's real work. It's real work mm-hmm. we've got to commit to. I wonder, do I have the capacity for not getting bored and tired of it, for finding mm-hmm. chemistry in that, for mm-hmm. finding excitement in that, in something predictable, something stable, something where I don't have to constantly assert my boundaries. I don't have to constantly mm-hmm. over function. I don't know. And that's the scary part because right. the, addic- the, the, the trauma bonding stuff, the addictive stuff, the, the drama stuff it, hit, hits a deep place. It's like when you have a bite of your favorite food from childhood, mm-hmm. it's like nothing replaces that. <laughs> right. Right. Um, when you talk about like, you know, like you can't, you you can't date someone who is you know healthy and stuff i have been i've been searching for this person right i want to be dating someone who has done their work because now that i have figured out what my pattern is now i'm ready to be with this person because i haven't searched for this person now i'm ready to be there but for me that piece about boring stuff you know mm-hmm. i think i have been tackling that problem for a really long time for myself and I think for me I have answered it for myself Mm. and that answer is the way I have relationships right so I am not monogamous Uh, I am polyamorous I'm an independent polyamorous person and the ways in which I have sex you know like I should say I'm kinky and it's not just for play it's like a lifestyle So that makes my sex life and my relationship style very exciting and very um, interactive, very intentional, right? Because it's something that 
you're always engaging with, right? Mm -hmm. um, not to say that monogamy mm -hmm. is something you don't engage with, but, but currently, or I should say historically, it's been like a, a way that, you know, you find something, you, you find someone, you mate with them, and that's it. It's like you found your person and you're with them, like how we've been talking about. It's, it's like right. how long you can be with them. Today, in present time, I think if you are monogamous and doing it in a sex positive and, you know, very intentional way, then it can be just as mm -hmm. um, exciting as I'm talking about. So, yeah, I think that I have answered that because my, for me, I thought when I was in monogamous relationships, I couldn't do it. And I loved the people that I was with very much. Right. I have the capacity to love. I have the capacity to be in relationships and all that, but I could not be in monogamous relationships. Yeah. That did not work for me. I think I've run into the boring factor even with poly people. Mm -hmm. For me, the boring, the boredom could, doesn't, it can happen around sex for sure. It's like, I need the fucked up sex. Like that's <laughs> the way. Absolutely. Better. Number one. <laughs> yeah, so where I'm getting it from the person I'm dating or from somebody, some other random person, like, doesn't matter. But, like, I mean, you know, it's like if there's a conflict, if there's a conflict, which I then have to overfunction to constantly resolve the conflict, then I feel like I'm not finding intimacy. It's like I found intimacy so long for so long through that conflict resolution process oh. that I struggle to then find it somewhere else. I feel like that's where it's at. And as some people understand this as like, oh, the makeup sex is so good. So that's mm. that's one manifestation of that right. conflict resolution high. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's that's what is missing for me. I think that it's really easy for people outside of us to judge the decisions that we've made to see us as protecting the people who harmed us but you know on a pragmatic level we we have are choosing from a list of like really terrible options and on an emotional level for those of us that were harmed by people extremely close to us whether it's a sibling or a parent or another important family member we are conditioned from the day that we are born to protect and love that person and that person has often been grooming us to um, per, to prioritize what they want over our own safety and our own needs and it's sort of like I mean for lack of a better term like being brainwashed and I think of uh, our friend Amitha Swadeen who has talked about blood supremacy and how we're all socialized to like protect our biological family at all costs and so survivors are making these calculations that are horrible and that really <laughs> other people are in no place to judge because we are navigating our own harm. We're navigating the guilt we feel and the responsibility we feel for what's happening in our families. We are navigating a violent state who can come in at any time and increase the harm and the trauma in an infinite capacity. I, I've, I've definitely been quiet about harm I've experienced as a child um, because of punitive kind of measures that I knew would break up my family. When I lived in Hawaii, Hawaii is a, a place where a lot of children are actually removed from their homes and into foster care with particularly white families. And that was always the constant threat for us after um, my father had been exposed for harming harming uh, our family. After leaving us, uh, it was just the constant threat of being taken away and, and then living with like an, another man where he was, um, you know, abusing me in very violent ways and him telling me like, I can't tell these uh, CPS people, uh, child protection services in Hawaii because that would break up my family and utilizing that kind of fear of, of the state or a fear of breaking up in order to silence, you know, my, my experiences or control me. And I think that, um, that, yeah, that does a, that does its toll on, on children 
because there are probably times where um, I will prevent myself from doing things because of future impact or future involvement of the state or future, you know. We're expecting people not to enable, but there's literally no model, no instructions, no education, no support right. for like, okay, like what do I, how do I not enable? Right. Like how do I not enable abusive behavior and get out and then make a life for myself outside of that? How mm -hmm. do I find people who right. are not abusive? So like you were saying, there's the blame. Right. There's a blame without support. There's a blame without education. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole damn thing, right? <laughs> because really, it's like we, we expect people to have the answers and to know how to be in relationships, have sex, do all the things. And that's what we lack the biggest. That, I mean, that's the lack right there. We know there's yeah. no education and then there's no support. That is the biggest piece of it, how mm -hmm. we connect with one another, how we communicate, how we bond with one another, how mm -hmm. all of it. We don't have a very, very good model for that. And then we connect that to our families of origins, right? Our, you know, I know my family didn't have the best model. You know, their families probably didn't have the best yeah. models. You know, hopefully as we get, you know, generations coming on, we're learning more and more. But I struggle with my family for communication. I, yeah. I do not know my family. Yeah. And so my plight, my thing has been... I mean, I want to talk. I want to communicate. I want to know things. I want information. And especially as a survivor, I want information because I don't want to be in the dark. Yeah, the action. And what this time, I think what we want folks to do is to maybe do a little reflection to their own families of origin. We want you to share, first share, how you would describe your family of origin. So you could say, growing up, my family was, and we've given you some options for adjectives, but you can choose something else that works for you. Mm. Um, you know, my family was loving, caring, or distant and manipulative or nurturing and supportive, mean and chaotic. So like pick some adjectives that you think describe your family of origin. And then uh, in the next part, share, or like, yeah, the next sentence, share, um, despite that, or in honor of that, especially if right. you feel like you had a family um, with functional dynamics within it, you know, I choose to not enable abusive behavior in my adult relationships. So like almost like an affirmation that yes, my family of origin was this way or that way, but despite that or in honor of that, I will choose not to enable this kind of behavior and make sure you <clears throat> tag it with hashtag caution series hashtag bad survivors and hashtag survivors to enable and post it on social media uh facebook twitter instagram we're all all of that uh, at heal to end with the number two and make sure you check out our website we'll have instructions for the action for each episode uh, on our website and also please do not forget to subscribe to our youtube channel yes. hit the bell and make sure you support us on patreon so we can just keep making these videos yes thank you cautioners